and they've proclaimed that to be the exact history of how things went down. I would like just to see you have a conversation with this guy because, like, again, he's very impressive. His ability to describe these things and his recall of the information is second to none. Well, I, what I would say to the younger Dryas so far, and, and the, uh, certainly the Fireball article, uh, you know, published back in 2005 or six, had some currency for quite a number of years. Uh, I obviously, when I was working on these initial chapters, or particularly on that Clovisia, the beautiful chapter uh, for Wild New World, I mean, I looked at uh, what scientific literature I could find in the journals, and they weren't really citing it anymore. And I think the reason was basically this. The argument goes as a kind of a test for something that could cause a, a major extinction is, okay, so the younger dry has produced a cold pulse to be sure, but it's going to be difficult to argue that these animals are going to expire in a cold pulse when they survive the glacial maximum that's not his 8, argument. years ago. His argument is massive devastation. His yeah. ar argument is instant flooding, uh, the, the creation of the Great Lakes almost instantaneously. It's a wild argument. Well, it's a wild conversation. So here, here, here are the other two arguments then. The other two arguments are if you have an extinction, like the five that we've had before. And I mean, I argue that, you know, we're all talking about the sixth extinction when we're in. Mm -hmm. My argument, sort of following an article that was published in the National Academy of Sciences in, in 2018, is that the sixth extinction that we think of today has actually, unlike all the previous five, the fifth one being Chicxulub, the sixth one has actually been happening in slow motion for 30,000 years. It's not just started. It's happening, as the people in the National Academy of Sciences piece put it, when humans spread out of Africa, took out more than 300 mammal species as they spread across the earth uh, over the subsequent uh, several thousand years, and cost us in what they called in this 2018 article uh, a, almost a worst case scenario, cost us like two and a half billion years of specially evolved genetics. Mm. So the reason I have been following that argument, and that's kind of the one I do, is that when the younger, driest thing comes up, what people point out is that in all the extinctions before the Pleistocene one, those extinctions took out everything. They took out life in the oceans. They took out small creatures. They took out amphibians, reptiles, birds. But the Pleistocene seems to just be mammals and often just big mammals. And so there's this sort of logical attempt to try to come up with what would explain an extinction scenario that doesn't take out things in the ocean, that doesn't take out little creatures, but just focuses on big mammals, which is why sort of the consensus is going towards this human spread. Then I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think you probably have both things working in conjunction. And I think the good explanation for why it only kills things that are on Earth and not in the ocean is that it impacts the ice shell, it impacts these ice sheets and causes this almost instantaneous melting of the ice caps in a catastrophic way. And not everything is affected by it, only the things that get impacted by the water and get impacted by this melting of the caps. I don't know enough about it to have this conversation with you, but I'm blown away by this guy, Randall Carlson, and his d descriptions of it and his understanding of it. And I just think it would be an amazing thing to get together with you. There's no doubt human beings had a massive effect on it. And I think that all these things that you're pointing out are really fascinating and pretty tragic, too, that human beings did. I mean, Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you want some more current JR Eclipse and check out some of these stunning shirts. Link below.